Well, good morning, everyone. As your um, books will show you, uh, this is one of the special events for our annual Congress, the Presidential Lectures. Um, we've established these lectures some time ago, um, honoring the two uh, gentlemen that began the society, Stan Fon and David Marsden. And uh, over the last year or two, I believe, we've also combined the special honor of the uh, junior awards in both clinical and basic science uh, and have now sandwiched those uh, between the two uh, named uh, lectures. Um, it's a special year this year where, uh, given where we are, given the history of uh, the location of our meeting and so with the tradition that we're establishing, the history of our society in honoring two great men, uh, we also recognize uh, the tremendous tradition that, uh, that this location provides us. Uh, traditionally, we have had uh, the uh, Fawn and Marsden lecture separate two different aspects of our, our field. So uh, the David Marsden lecture has generally been a um, basic science lecture. The Stan Fawn lecture has been a clinical science lecture. But we're straying a little bit from that course uh, for an obvious reason that I've already indicated, the tremendous history that uh, this location provides us with uh, movement disorders of mesoganglia disease. And there's really only one person that any of us could think of that could do justice to this, someone who is a, a, both a scientist and an historian. And uh, so it was uh, quite a logical choice uh, for the Stanley Fawn Lecture to ask uh, Chris Getz to give that. And he's going to talk about Jean-Martin Charcot and movement disorders historical legacies to the 21st century. And I'll just honor him with the plaque for the uh, Fawn lecture before he begins. <laughs> Photographs later. Thank you, Tony. And to all of the uh, audience here, it's an enormous pleasure for me to uh, take this honor and to join other members of the society who have earned this uh, award for uh, clinical neurology. And it's especially touching for me because it's linked to Stan Fawn, who's both my colleague and my mentor. This is my disclosure statement. Nothing relates to this area of history because there isn't any support for this kind of uh, research. Um, in receiving this award for historical research efforts, I'm going to focus on Jean-Martin Charcot, whose portrait occupies the left part of your slide. Um, Charcot's life and his career are intimately related to the history of Paris, the city where we have gathered for this meeting. And Charcot and his neurological contributions have been the focus of several years of my research efforts. I'm going to structure my talk to emphasize Charcot's contributions to movement disorders, but especially those that have a pertinence to our work in the 21st century. I will also share with you some of the unique challenges of doing historical research in terms of methodology and focus. And I will try to anchor my talk always with the words of Charcot himself. Now, Jean-Martin Charcot was the premier clinical neurologist of the 19th century, and he spent his entire career at the Salpetriere Hospital that's shown here in Paris and raised the institution from a hospice for old women to a neurological mecca of neurological study. His lectures drew students and visitors from around the world and trained a generation of neurologists of younger people who would largely dominate the field in the generation after his death. His service was organized in a very tight and authoritatively managed unit with a core team called the Cercle Intime, or the Inner Circle, and then around this was a halo of visitors and students. Now, it is important to understand that the Salpetriere was not a natural focal point for medical interest, and it was situated far outside the general geography of medical Paris. What I'm showing you here is in the Fifth Arrondissement, the medical school itself, which is a lovely place to visit. But the walk to the Salpetriere involves a rather 
several, several minutes of about 35 to 40 minutes going through the botanical gardens to still what is a relatively isolated area. To draw students and to attract them from the medical geography down to the Salpetriere, Charcot actually developed two types of teaching exercises. The first is shown here, in which there were formal lectures on Friday in which a neurological topic was treated in its full depth and included early slides as shown on this drawing, also diagrams, charts, and Charcot would pass around examples of bones, uh, medical specimens, and other materials so that the audience could actually touch and examine them close up. These Friday lectures were published in many languages as the complete works of Charcot and are really the compiled lectures from this Friday series. Now, in addition, the second teaching event was a very popular show-and-tell uh, series of lectures that occurred on Tuesdays. And they focused on neurological diagnosis. Charcot sat amongst the audience with a patient in front of him and culled the necessary details from the patient in order to come up with a neurological diagnosis. These impromptu dialogues were not only the dialogues themselves, but also he would turn and comment to the audience to try and place the, uh, the comments of the patient in a neurological context of a broader ampler. The sessions were hand transcribed by his students along with drawings, and this is just one example of many in the uh, Tuesday lesson uh, portfolios. These documents, along with the patient files that exist to a limited extent in the archives of the Bibliothèque Charcot at the Charcot Library at the Salpêtrière, these are the core documents that have facilitated my research. But I warn you that archival documents are not really centralized in France. There are no integrated catalogs or computer searches that are easy to access. Many materials, including letters, drawings, administrative documents, have, that have really contributed to my research have been drawn from several different sources, including those owned by the Charcot family. This type of research requires a certain tenacity, a constant vigilance. The final product is shown here, in which one sees Charcot's own notes, one sees supportive documents, photographs, here a, a footprint from a patient who stepped into an ink pad to show the high arches, and finally, then, the autopsy material, all supported by publications that were relative. But it would be wrong for you to think that all this is from a single source. In fact, many things are taken from other libraries, and some of this is found serendipitously. And so the final product is wonderful, but in fact it takes a tremendous amount of work to come to, to, come to it. In order to access things, there are certain strategies, all right? The French libraries are really organized to protect and to conserve documents, not to share them. So one cannot enter into a French library and say, I just like to look. It doesn't work that way. Writing ahead, justifying your credentials, asking very specific questions, really to establish your own credibility, these are very much part of the effort. Now, knowing people is very important, all right? And they can really help you in terms of facilitating the access. I show several of them, not all of them, but Yves Gide was very helpful. Bruno Dubois, who seems to know everyone in Paris, was also helpful. Michel Bonduel, who's really the living authority on Charcot in France, as well as Jean-Louis Signoret, who has died, they, they helped me as well. And librarians know librarians, and Madame Le Rougon, who runs the Charcot Library, put me in touch with librarians that allowed me even access to the most daunting of the libraries, the Bibliothèque Nationale and the Archive Nationale. And finally, the Charcot family. Uh, Madame Alar Charcot, who is the, was the granddaughter of Charcot, and her husband were very important in welcoming me to their home and to the access to their documents. And their daughter, Madame Valin Charcot, has honored us as an honorary member of the uh, Congress today and is here in the audience. Now, the anchor of Charcot's research technique was the anatomoclinical method, or the méthode anatomoclinique. And with this term, adapted from the methods of Lenech, Charcot placed dual emphasis on the clinical or hospital medicine 
and then laboratory science, emphasizing the resultant cross-fertilization. And in his own words, and I'll quote now, I firmly believe that in medicine there are areas that belong solely to doctors, for only they can properly cultivate and bring these areas to fruition. These domains are necessarily closed to scientists who day in, day out are confined to their laboratories and would disdain the teaching methods of the hospital. But I believe in equal fervor that the anatomy and physiology laboratory must have input into the issues of medical science in order for medicine to, uh, to progress. To me, the practice of medicine has no real autonomy. It exists by borrowing and making new applications of ideas from other disciplines. Without a constant reinfusion from other scientific domains, the practice of medicine would soon become an outmoded routine. The two-part strategy of the anatomoclinical method involved, first, thorough and unbiased documentation of clinical signs, and second, the autopsy findings. Now, in the first phase, the examination of a large series of patients with similar or contrasting signs was facilitated because the Salpetriere housed over 5,000 chronically ill and lifelong residents of the institution. As wards of the state, the second phase was feasible because these patients were automatically available for autopsy after death. The correlation between clinical signs and anatomical lesions was the core axis of Charcot's neurologic methodology. In his early years as a staff physician, and with some help from his colleague, Volpion, Charcot categorized patients from the masses of randomized, agglomerated patients as shown in this drawing from the epoch. He based the categorization on predominant neurological signs, weakness, tremor, convulsion, and other categories. Within each category, Charcot studied the prototypic cases and subdivided each class with further clinical designations. As such, Charcot provided the first sound nosography of neurology. Now here's an example. Charcot had a unit with patients with tremor and started to categorize these patients based on posture. And so AB represents the resting posture and BC the action posture. And he noticed that one group of patients, often with spasticity and other neurological signs, filled the first category, the top line, having an action tremor and a, a, an acceleration in their tremor, but no rest tremor. The bottom panel shows patients who also had rigidity and slowness of movement and had a rhythmic resting tremor. And then the middle panel had resting tremor that persisted with the posture but didn't increase with action. When he looked at autopsy specimens, the top panel, these patients showed the same types of lesions that Covellier had already described in autopsy specimens of multiple sclerosis. The patients in the bottom panel had no documented neurological lesions and fell into the category of clinically being defined as Parkinson's disease, but pathologically as a nevrose or a neurologic condition without a known neuropathology. Charcot's students discovered the brainstem lesion of Parkinson's disease after their mentor's death. The clinical phase of the anatomical clinical method was highly detailed and scientifically creative. To capture the Parkinsonian patients shown in the top, he engaged medical artists, professionals, and medical sculptors to capture the static signs in the archetypal cases. He also made plaster casts and wax casts of deformities. These materials were used in the teaching sessions, in his publications, and also physically transported to international meetings to great acclaim. For gait analysis, he had patients step into ink pads or cinder boxes and then walk across a surface, surface in order to document gait problems. Charcot adapted tools, we still have them? adapted tools from other fields and added the field of medical illustration and then progressed to medical photography to document the signs with even less bias. Many of these photographs have been destroyed, but in fact, in the Countway Library of Harvard University, there are several thousand that still exist. These are interesting because they are silver positives and very delicate to touch 
The paper descriptive cases are also, they, they decompose when one, one touches them, but they are nonetheless a very important iconographic resource for someone with a, an interest in this area. He advanced further with photography and used multi-frame photography to capture movement disorders such as this patient with Gilles Latourette syndrome. Medical cinematography came after Charcot's career and was really developed in the years after with his students. Um, Charcot did not use medical cinematography as far as we understand. Now in all aspects of this first phase of the anatomical clinical method, Charcot was a visual artist. Careful and unbiased observation with documentation was the anchor of his effort. As movement disorder specialists, likewise, we rely most, uh, most concentratedly on our visual sense. Charcot reminded his students in his lecture in 1888, and again, I quote, let someone say of a doctor that he really knows his physiology or anatomy, that he is dynamic. These are not real compliments. But if you say that he is an observer, a person who knows how to see, this is perhaps the greatest compliment one can make. As I think of this in lines of our current Congress here, I'd like to uh, say to Stan that I think the same of you here. The second step of the anatomical clinical method was to conduct a systematic autopsy of patients and to attempt to correlate the signs with the specific lesions. To return to the example of tremors, Charcot found that the patients with the action tremor and with dyssynergia had these typical white matter lesions. These are his own drawings of the microscopic findings of these patients. On the other hand, in those with rest tremor, he failed to find these lesions or any other. Charcot's discovery was the first discrete separation of Parkinson's disease from multiple sclerosis based on the combination of combined clinical and pathological signs. Now Charcot returned to the clinical arena to study these rest tremor patients in further detail. Reading English and being a very strong Anglophile, he was aware of James Parkinson's monograph essay on the shaking palsy. He in fact owned his own copy. He told his students in his classroom lectures that were hand transcribed, and again I quote, this is a descriptive and vivid definition that is correct for many cases, most in fact, and will always have the advantage over others of having been the first. Charcot never lost the opportunity to document neurologic disease, and regardless of work or vacation, while visiting Morocco, at that time part of France, he sketched this Parkinsonian patient. Though not a skilled artist, his sketches capture the essential features of the disease, the joint deformities, the rigid posture, and his shadowing evokes tremor. Charcot was impressed by slowness and impressed by rigidity, but he was most interested in the slowness of the movement. Charcot's recognition of bradykinesia is really his contribution to Parkinson's disease. So let me quote what he said to his students. Long before rigidity actually develops, Patients have significant difficulty performing ordinary activities. This problem relates to another cause. In some of the various patients I'm showing you, you can easily recognize how difficult it is for them to do things, even though rigidity and tremor is not the limiting feature. Instead, even a cursory ex examination demonstrates that their problem relates to slowness in execution, not weakness. In spite of tremor, a patient is still able to do things, but he performs them with remarkable slowness. Between the thought and the action, there is a considerable time lapse. One would think the neural activity can only be effected with remarkable effort. He also appreciated the posture and gait of uh, difficulties of Parkinson's disease patients and drew this typical patient. He lectured on this patient. If you tap on him, he will propulse forward, and his gait will be unusual. His head will bend forward. He takes a few steps, they become quicker and quicker, to the point that he will bump into the wall and hurt himself. If I pull on his trousers from behind, he will retropulse in the same distinctive way. Now, the volume of patients, as shown here in these drawings of the Salpetriere uh, population, allowed Charcot the opportunity to continually reinforce and modify his thinking. 
Having established the prototypic signs of Parkinson's disease, he moved further on to assess the variants of the archetype. He le his lecture in the 19th century still resonates because those of us who have to face patients who do not quite fit the archetypal picture still are very much in the vein of what Charcot had to deal with. He said, studying archetypes is the fundamental test in nosography. It's indispensable and the only way to extract from the chaos of imprecision a specific pathological diagnosis. But once the archetype is established, a second phase begins. You must dissect the archetype and analyze its parts. One must, in other words, be ready to recognize the imperfect forms, the form frus, and examples where only one feature occurs in isolation. Using this second method, the physician will see the archetypal illness in an entirely new light. One's scope enlarges, and the illness becomes much more important to the doctor's daily practice. To the patient's benefit, the doctor becomes attentive and sensitive to recognizing a disease even when it is in its earliest developmental stages. As an example of this, I show you the first case of the typical patient with Parkinson's disease next to a second drawing by Charcot of a patient with a more extended posture. His facial features are drawn on the other panel with the contracted frontalis and the stare that is very typical of likely progressive supranuclear palsy. Charcot recognized this as a variant, did not name it as progressive supranuclear palsy because that was not defined yet. Likewise, the photograph below, an arched posture, which he, he described as a noble bearing, but also asymmetry with a contracted hand suggesting the possibility of either PSP or cortical basal degeneration. Now, Charcot was never daunted by complicated cases that did not quite fit the archetypal picture. This tender sketch of Charcot pondering a brain was drawn by his student, Plisseau. Charcot warned his students, because a patient is complex, he becomes a real study subject. After all, clinical medicine is above all the study of the difficult aspects and complexities of diseases. When a patient calls on you, he is under no obligation to have a simple disease just to please you. Whereas Charcot had great vision in terms of incorporating modern technology and international advances into a synthesized view of neurological illness, he was nonetheless a man of his times. Very little focus was ever placed on causation of illness and infectious, metabolic, and environmental etiologies were never seriously considered. In the 19th century, the primary assumption was that neurologic disorders were hereditary, and this perspective was both an advantage and a disadvantage to Charcot. Charcot lectured frequently on the concept of families carrying a neurological trait, or a tash, that weakened the neurological system and placed patients at risk. The actual phenotype, however, could vary, as shown in this family tree. Here the father is hemiplegic and aphasic. The mother is epileptic, and each of the children has neurological disease, but a different phenotype. Locomotor ataxia, weakness, bizarre and incoherent behaviors. Rarely, as in Huntington's disease, the pattern could follow what he called similar transmission, where the phenotype remained static from generation to generation. In his view, however, these were really the same issue. It was a matter of hereditary disease, and while Huntington's disease was an extreme example of similar transmission, it was not fundamentally different than any other of the family trees. Now, this caused confusion in the later years because he considered Sydenham's chorea and Huntington's disease as really similar hereditary transmission and did not appreciate the separateness of these two conditions. On the other hand, as we move into our 21st century, I'm impressed that examples like cerebellar ataxias, where we have a single gene that we can identify and yet we are seeing multiple phenotypes, is much closer to this kind of picture 
than what we would have predicted with Huntington's disease. Likewise with Gillette-Tourette syndrome, where we are still puzzled of whether we should be including into the genetic probands those patients who have just uh, obsessive compulsive disorder without tics, whether we should include those with hyperactivity without tics as representations of the same genetic defect. It is this kind of thinking that in fact brings us back to Charcot, who was not puzzled by this kind of unusual phenotypic variation. Now, as a person, Charcot was quiet, authoritative, a stocky man described as Napoleonic or likened to the Roman Caesars. Teaching was highly formalized and hierarchical, as shown in the lineup from senior to junior in the, uh, at the teaching, even at the bedside. The, um, he was often cold, distant, but his power and his devotion to his students earned him a strong fidelity among his junior staff. These junior staff members were invited to his evening soiree and mingled with political figures, European royalty, some of whom were his patients, and through Charcot's celebrity, the inner circle devotees were exposed to artistic and theatrical figures of the day. In the winter, they uh, gathered at the family mansion that is currently available for visiting. It's on the Boulevard Saint-Germain. It is no longer a private home, but you still can visit it and has some of the uh, retained rooms as well as a beautiful inner garden. In the summer, the family retreated to the chalet in the Bois de Boulogne. This latter house sits among high-rise apartment buildings today, but remains the Charcot's family home. It's a national landmark, and it can be visited by contacting Charcot's descendants. It is within walking distance of the Congress Center. Now, movement disorders is a neurological area that abounds in treatment opportunities, and Charcot was alert to early remedies. Through his supervision of his intern, Ordenstein, anticholinergic drugs were signaled as a benefit for Parkinsonian tremor. Here is a prescription that I found perchance in the Philadelphia College of Physicians tucked into a book that was completely unrelated, but it is in Charcot's hand. It is for a patient with Parkinson's disease, and it covers hyoscyamine and anticholinergic, as well as an ergot-based compound, and we, I think the clinicians will appreciate that the early dopamine agonists were all ergot-based drugs. Likewise, Charcot emphasized the importance of searching for new therapies. And so when he read about uh, suspension therapy that had been developed in Russia, he tried this at the Salpetriere. He re immediately saw that this was not going to help patients and that he abandoned it quickly, but he nonetheless was willing to give it a clinical trial and publish the results. Based on observations of patients with Parkinson's disease, who felt great relief from pain and fatigue after riding on a, on a horse, in a carriage, or on a train, he developed this vibratory chair that was part of the Salpetriere treatment uh, wing. He found that sessions of 30 minutes, multiple times weekly, in fact improved symptoms and sleep. Now vibration therapy has emerged in medicine currently in sports medicine, in orthopedics, and in certain areas of neurology, and we have the modern equipment to test this. So I put forth to the group the possibility of using Charcot's early observations to test again in a more modern environment. Of all the therapeutic efforts, Charcot was adamant that physicians should never place the subjects at risk, a lesson that resonates today over 100 years after his death. He stated, and I quote, if you do not have a proven treatment for certain illnesses, bide your time, do what you can, but do not harm your patients. I wish to close with a reflection by Charcot as he faced the challenges of dealing with incurable and progressive illnesses, a situation that will resonate to the clinicians in the audience. The case presentation from which I'll quote involved a man with an incurable disease and after comforting the patient and even telling him that he would have some instructions about how to feel better, he closed the lecture hall door and turned to his students with these words. Now that the patient is no longer here, we can and must speak amongst ourselves in total frankness. The most varied remedies with the most logical bases will be entirely impotent to slow the progression of this disease. It is sad to say, but it's true, 
And sadness is hardly the issue for the doctor. Truth is our issue. Let us keep looking in spite of everything. Let us keep searching, for it is indeed the best way to find. And perhaps thanks to our efforts, the verdict that we will give such a patient tomorrow is not what we need to give him today. I really thank you for your attention. This little patchwork quilt has many people who have honored my career and been important, my life. Many people are not on this just because of size and the acquisition of, pay, of, of uh, photos. But truly, a life that is successful is anchored in wonderful people to surround me. So I thank you for your attention. I thank you for this honor. And Stan, it is an enormous honor to be named in your light.